subsequent year. Okay, let's say that again. The larvae come out first, um, and if they feed on a host, they're going to molt and come out the next year as a nymph. So, and remember I also said that the larvae hatch uninfected with the Lyme spirochete. So what's happening here is the nymphs are feeding on hosts this time, infecting new hosts just in time for the larvae to come out when they're not infected. So this, this is a very uh, important part of the, of, of the cycle in this part of the country. Um, it's called reverse phenology, and it ensures that there's going to be a, an infected tick population and mouse population. So this is a great place to find uh, nymphs and larval uh, black-legged or deer ticks. They like to hang out in the leaf litter um, and, uh, because they're very sensitive to drying out. This is a, a great place to find um, the adult stage of the deer tick, um, be, not only because um, they, they like this tall grass right here, but the deer like this as well, because they like that patchwork environment. Woods, meadow, fields, yards, that's what the deer prefer. Ergo, so do the black-legged ticks. This is where I usually collect the, the adults. The nymphs, you have to go into the woods. I don't like doing that. Uh, it's easier to collect adults. So. Uh, this was a number of years ago, uh, that snow on the ground, um, and the warm front came through. This is in Washington Reservation in Union County, and it collected about a dozen black-legged adult ticks right here. So they can come out even in the winter on a warm day. Okay, how does a tick feed? Uh, remember I said they have to feed for a couple days? They're not like mosquitoes. But before they can do that, they have to find a host. So the first thing they do is they have to quest, well, that means hanging off the vegetation. So most of the nymphs and the larvae um, will hang off the lower vegetation in the leaf litter, all right? And they'll just hang on. And if they see something coming, or they can't really see, actually. But if they detect something coming along, they put their forearms out like this. So right here and right here. So these are adult dog ticks. They're questing but they didn't detect my breath yet. This is a, a female deer tick, and that's a female lone star tick. They detected my breath, and they put their forelegs out. They have carbon dioxide sensors in their forelegs. They can detect the breath of their potential hosts. So they find a host. Um, they, first thing, the second thing they do is they crawl upwards. Um, and then they find a good spot to feed. Um, then what they do is they take their chelicerae, These are the mouth parts right here. Those two things, narrow things in the middle, they're called chelicerae. They'll dig into the skin like this. And then the tick will insert the hypostome. And then we'll feed, if this is an adult deer tick, five to seven days. Um, remember I said these ticks quest, right? Some ticks don't. This is Hyaloma dromedarii. You'll, you won't find that in New Jersey, hopefully. You'll find it in the desert in, in the Middle East. This thing will actually run across hot sand after a camel. So um, good thing we don't have those here. OK, so remember I said the tick has to feed for a number of days. Uh, in order to do that, it has to make sure that you don't know the tick is feeding on you. So it has to, in addition to the um, anticoagulants to keep your blood flowing, it has to also secrete platelet inhibitors, uh, other anticoagulants, thrombin inhibitors, and kinases. What does that mean? That means these chemical components in the tick saliva will reduce inflammation so that you don't itch, you don't scratch. A mosquito usually itches as soon as it bites you, but that's because they usually fly away. These things got to feed for a number of days. So they have these, all these components in their saliva to make sure you don't know that you're being fed upon. Uh, and this is just an um, example of uh, 12 hours, one day, two days and four days. And besides salivation, they have to take in so much blood, they also have to take out the good stuff and regurgitate the stuff they won't, don't want. So they're salivating and regurgitating into you. Um, so here's an example of how big these ticks can get. This is a female ix Ixodes scapularis, unfed, partially fed, and these are fully fed. So that used to be that. 
They have to take in that much blood because they have to nourish the eggs. So um, with respect to black-legged ticks, where do you find them on the body? You can find them anywhere. This is a study done a number of years ago by a colleague of mine, and uh, they'll go anywhere in your body. Now, from my experience and from what I've heard from readings and other people, deer ticks, I'm sorry, strike that from the record. American dog ticks or wood ticks prefer to go for the head. And I don't know why that is. They like the, the hair, I guess. Um, I pulled a couple out of me this year so far. And when I have a good day of tick collecting, I don't sleep at night. Um, so you'll find them anywhere. OK, Lyme spirochetes. So the, the bacterial name is called Borrelia burgdorferi. It's named after Willie Burgdorfer, who discovered it. Um, so this is the, those are the two ticks that transmit it in this country. The primary, I'm not a doctor, the primary symptom is arthritis. In Europe and Asia, it's um, Borrelia guarani transmitted by this tick, um, causes neurological problems. Um, and in Europe, Borrelia afzelii, uh, transmitted by Ixodes racinus and causes primarily ACA, achroma dermatitis chronica atrophicans. You can have overlap. So sometimes you can have neurological symptoms in the United States. In fact, many times you do. Um, so this is um, from a number of years ago. I crushed up a tick and, and, and stained it with a fluorescent antibody. I think there's two or three there. And then we can grow in culture and get a whole mess of them. These are the spirochetes right here. That's why they get that name, spirochete. They're spiral shaped. And, and they, you're not going to, um, like if you ever heard of someone coming down with sepsis and they're septic and they have just a ton of bacteria in their blood, it doesn't go that way with the Lyme spirochetes. They're very low in numbers. They like to swim around and hide. So. And, and you, when you go to the doctor and he or she takes a throat swab because you have strep throat, they get a goop of pus and they streak it on a plate and they grow up the bug. You can't do that with, with the Lyme spirochete. It doesn't grow in such large numbers. Okay, so um, in the intro, I forgot to tell you about um, any vector-borne disease. There's, there's a vector, there's a pathogen, and there's a host or a reservoir. So the vector here is the Ixodes tick. Uh, the pathogen is the Borrelia. And the reservoir is the um, Paramiscus leucopus, the white-footed mouse. So everyone says, where does the spirochete come from? That's where it's coming from, the white-footed mouse. Because remember I said, when the mother tick lays eggs, they hatch uninfected. How do they get infected? White-footed mouse. So it's a highly competent reservoir. What that means is, if you get a small number of ticks feeding on one white-footed mouse, it's darn sure it's going to become infected. A lot of other animals aren't, don't work that way. Um, it's the most numerous small mammal in some regions of this country, especially in the Northeast. Um, once infected, it stays infected, and it doesn't hurt it. So far, they've shown known uh, side effects from, the, from infection. Um, and the most common host for immature I. scapularis is the white-footed mouse. And like I said, they don't get sick. So this is the problem. Is it's the white-footed mouse. Uh, but you can also see ticks on birds. Here's a, two nymphs right here feeding on. I think that's a viri. That's from a number of years ago. Uh, they'll feed on chipmunks, anything. Ixodes scapularis, they use the term Catholic feeder because it will feed on anything. Uh, yes, uh, dogs get infected. There's <coughs> a question in the literature about cats. Um, chipmunks get infected. They're, they're competent, and some birds are competent. Do they have s signs and symptoms? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. Yes? Right. Yeah, I should have spoke about that. Previously, so the 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 hard line is that um, the tick needs to feed for at least 48 hours, 36 to 48 hours, to transmit the spirochete. And a lot of people disclaim that, but <coughs> excuse me, those that data was from animal studies, and it was shown in animal studies it takes at least 48 hours to transmit the spirochete. 
and there's a biochemical reason for that. Um, the spirochete, I don't have a slide of it, um, the spirochete usually lives in the mid-gut of the tick, okay? In an unfed tick, if you were to go out in the field, you'd find the tick in the mid-gut. Tick finds a host, starts to take in blood. The spirochete changes surface proteins, gets released from the mid-gut, travels to the salivary glands, and that's where it gets transmitted. And that biochemical change takes 24 hours. So that, that's why it takes so long. Not as long for other things, um, but yes, it, it usually, but a lot of people, you know, disclaim that. They said, well, I was infected in less than a day. And I, I facetiously argue, because I'm a scientist, I'm, I just, I work on observations. I said, so you know when it started feeding on you. I don't know, but I, and I get in a lot of trouble when I say stuff like that, because I'm a consultant for the Lyme Disease Foundation, and, and, and they, you know, and, and understandably, there are cases where it can happen in less time. Got a question? <clears throat> How long does it take to get the red rash? Okay, number one, oh, I'll get to that, but, but while you answer the question, not everyone gets a red rash, and it can take a, a, a few days to a couple weeks. But I'll show you rashes, too, even though did I give you the disclaimer I'm not a physician. Okay. I'll do it again. Okay. <clears throat> so where do the deer fit in? So they call it deer tick. What, what's, what good are the deer? The deer are required for the reproduction of the tick. Has, in fact, the deer are deleterious to the spirochete. In other words, if you take a bunch of infected deer ticks and you feed them on a the deer, the spirochetes are going to die in the tick when it takes in the deer blood because they have a, a, a protein called serum complement that kills the spirochete. We have serum complement, but it doesn't seem to work, uh, our, our complement. So the deer is necessary for the reproduction of the black-legged ticks. Um, and what I just described is called zooprophylaxis, when the deer will actually kill the spirochete in the feeding tick. So uh, years ago, I used to go to deer check stations um, and photograph and take samples of the, the ticks on the deer. These are um, deer ticks on one ear of a, of a deer. Um, and, you know, between the two ears, the groin, the, the hind legs, I mean, they can, they can have probably a thousand ticks on them in some cases, um, and probably more in some other cases. But I, I've not personally observed it. So, um, and like I said, they don't necessarily feed on, on deer alone. They will also feed on bears. Um, these, this tick was taken from that bear, um, and here they're laying eggs. So they'll lay like 3,000 eggs. Um, and, uh, yeah, I forget. Yes, th that bear was from Montague, New Jersey, North Jersey. So they, the, the state um, traps the bears to monitor the bear population. So I go out with them just to take tick samples. So um, like I said, they need the deer for mating. So I took a picture of mating ticks, got it published on the International Journal of Ocarology, tick porn. Um, and this is, just shows you everything. So here's a female, unengorged, um, male, nymph, larva. Here's a replete female, and then she's laying eggs. Now, sh the female will not feed to completion until she mates with a male. So they'll stay on a, on, a, on a deer until they find a mate. And you'll see them actually mating on the deer. You can take pictures. I've taken pictures. And I, I gave a, tick, a lecture to a hunting group once, and a um, hunter came up to me and goes, well, that's what those two ticks are doing? Uh, he had a little hygiene problem, I guess. I don't know. Um, Okay, now the medical aspects. Oh yes, and did I say I'm not a medical doctor? So um, there's not really a bullseye rash. Um, there's a bullseye rash. There's a swollen knee, um, and this gentleman has facial palsy. Um, so the the Lyme spirochete's almost like the syphilis spirochete. It's neurotropic. It'll go for the nervous system once it enters the central spinal uh, central nervous system. Um, it'll cause inflammation of the nerves, and you try to smile, and you can't smile. Only half your face works. That's called facial palsy. Um, antibiotics work in the majority of 
with cases, the doxycycline is a good antibiotic, and doxycycline is good because it also works on some other tick-borne agents. Um, and there was a vaccine, but they removed it um, from the market. Um, more rashes. Some people, yes. Uh, the Smith Klein Beecham said uh, for marketing reasons, because you, you needed three doses, and you had to get a booster every year. And I had Connaught's vaccine in the clinical trial. I don't know if I got the placebo or the clinical. But in theory, you're supposed to get a booster every year. But they removed it from the market. They said it was a marketing issue. Right. Um, so I know the lighting's not that good in here, but sometimes you'll get mul multiple rashes. And there's multiple rashes here. And this is interesting because not only does he have rashes, he's got facial palsy. And palsy is usually one of the later s symptoms that you get. The rash is usually sooner, and I, I'm going to guess, I don't know offhand, maybe, like I said, in the early stages, maybe a few days to a, a couple weeks to show up. And it's, and it's not a reaction to the tick. It's the spirochete spreading through the skin. That's what causes the rash. And the immune response to the spirochete. <coughs> okay. Um, hold on. i got to take a hit of water. So before I leave Lyme disease, which is transmitted by Ixodes scapularis, this um, same tick also transmits anaplasmosis, and that's the bacterium, and babesiosis, um, also called Nantucket fever. And the organism is called Babesia microti. It's a, it's a plasmodium. It's a malaria-like um, uh, protozoan. It's not a bacterium like, like anaplasmosis and the Lyme spirochete. Um, and there's a great book called New Guinea Tapeworms and Jewish Grandmothers, um, Tales of Parasites and People. And uh, there's a chapter on uh, the dangerous nymph from Nantucket. It's a very good read. And uh, even though it first took place in Nantucket, part of the story has roots in New Jersey. It's a good book. Question. Uh, you, yes, there are. Yes, the, the, sorry? No, and there was older publications, and every once in a while you'll see a publication of somebody in, I don't know, some part of the world found a mosquito or a dog tick infected with the Lyme spirochete. Well, what, normally what that means is that that mosquito or that tick just fed on an animal that had a load of bacteria in its blood, and you just happened to find it, and you tested it, and it was positive. Because they do all kinds of studies where, they, where they'll take a dog tick and they'll infect it and it won't go to the next stage. It won't carry the spirochete to the next stage. So only Ixodes are considered vectors. I'm sorry? I think so. I mean, in humans. Yes, I believe so. Okay, I'm going to switch gears here, um, talk about another tick-borne disease in New Jersey, uh, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, and that's, um, a f you know what it is right now, right? You know it by now, right? Which one? Uh, you guys are going to fail the quiz. That's an American dog tick. That's a female, and uh, she's crawling down towards me because she detected my presence. Um, this was in a park near my house, and I've been doing the Lyme disease thing for, for many years, and I just started doing research on Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. So I'm used to deer ticks. They like the moist leaf litter. They like it nice and moist. They don't like it too hot. Well, this was 95 degree, 94 degrees that day in the full sun, and this thing's out waiting for a host. Um, they're, they're scary creatures. Um, so this is just some of the signs and symptoms. Um, it's not much of a problem as it used to be because it, it's treatable. Um, but here's some of the patechial rashes. Um, and in the pre-antibiotic area, it was 25% fatal. Currently, 5% fatality rate, um, unless it's misidentified or misdiagnosed. And doxycycline is the drug of choice, just like with Lyme spirochetes. Although other antibiotics will work with Lyme bacterium. OK, so back to this slide. Again, we're talking about Rocky Mountain spotted fever. That's the female. Uh, that's the female, and that's the male. Now, 
unlike Ixodes, uh, and this, the, the male Ixodes will not usually feed. This thing will feed for a little bit, but he won't engorge because he doesn't have to feed any eggs. He just needs um, the, um, the blood for sperm production. Okay, so let's look at some of the tick-borne diseases in New Jersey. Am, am I okay on time? Okay. Um, so Lyme disease from 2014 all the way to 2000, you can see there's just over 3,000 cases uh, a year in New Jersey. So we have like 10% of the country's caseload. Um, and we're one of the five states with 95% of the cases. Um, anaplasmosis, babesiosis, and then right now, um, whoops, wrong computer. Um, I'm looking at Rocky Mountain spotted fever. So you can see there's an increase. Um, the caseload's going up, not by much, and it's nothing like um, Lyme disease. And although it's called Rocky Mountain spotted fever, and the very first case was observed in Idaho, uh, but it's predominantly named after the uh, Bitterroot Mountains and the Rocky Mountains. Um, but this is where you see most of the cases. Um, and even New Jersey's got a lot of, a lot of cases. So this spring and summer, I've been going all over the entire state and collecting dog ticks and testing them. So uh, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, New Jersey. So you cut the state in half. You got the Philly fans and the Met fans. And most of the cases, this is confusing because I put the, number, the high number of cases up top and the lower number of cases on the bottom. However, if you look at the state, the higher number of cases in the south, and the fewer cases in the north. So we're Somerset. Somerset. We're six cases. And that's from 2004 to 2011. So there's not that many. But there's a number of questions. Um, so just to show you the range of the American dog tit that transmits um, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, and I'll, I'll mention this tick in a, in a little bit. But here's the range of the Lone Star tick. Um, and the original range used to be here. Now it's moving north. OK, so now we're going to talk about the Lone Star tick. Um, again, a female, a male, and a nymph. Uh, this is a 16th of an inch. And the primary uh, disease it transmits in this part of the world is called ehrlichiosis. And it's very similar to Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, uh, except you usually don't get a rash. Uh, and not everyone gets sick. Um, the bacterium is called Ehrlichia chaffiensis, and a similar uh, brother of that, or sister of that bacterium, uh, Ehrlichia ewingi, and um, dogs can get this as well. And Lone Star ticks are more aggressive, and they have longer mouth parts, so you have to watch out for them. They'll actually turn towards you and try to come after you. They can't go very far, but um, just something to keep heads up. Okay, Ehrlichia in New Jersey. Um, here's a summary from 2008 to 2015. So Somerset County had 11 cases, like I said before. Atlanta County had the most. Um, and remember, these are transmitted by the Lone Star tick. Um, let's look at a map for a second. So um, if you look at the map, a lot of the cases are in the southern part of the state where you find the Lone Star Tick. Um, there's been very, very few reported cases, I'm sorry, reported sightings of the Lone Star Tick in North Jersey. So where are those cases coming from? That's, I don't know, that's part of my thesis. So I'll come back in a couple of years, hopefully you have an answer. Yes, you have a question? Oh. Uh, because it, well, uh, it hasn't been proven to be conclusively tick transmitted. Now, I was in a study where they found it in the ticks, but it hasn't been conclusively studied um, to be a tick-borne pathogen yet. So, and again, that's controversial. This is where I'm glad I'm not a physician. Okay, tick control. Um, I won't spend too much time on this. Um, I mean, and. In Africa, the, the natural tick control is an oxpecker. Um, those are engorged ticks on this oxpecker. Um, in the old days, well, they actually still do it. They would 
take the cattle and put them in a dip of insecticide. And unfortunately, you can't do this with your kids or your pet. Um, but they're having a problem again with the cattle tick. And the other point to make about the slide is they use this to control the cattle tick. The cattle tick is a one-host tick. It has the larvae, the nymph, and the adult on the entire, its entire life cycle on the cow. Plus, it only feeds on cattle, just about. So you know where you're going to find it. Black-legged ticks, you don't know where you're going to find those. So is that, this, this technique won't work. Um, a few years back, they started planning um, and, and uh, it, implementing the um, four-poster control method. So what they do, they'd fill this with corn, and they'd put a uh, pesticide on this, and the deer would come in to feed, and they would um, get insecticide on their, on their necks and their ears, which is where most of the ticks are. And it works very well, except you're feeding deer, and it's very expensive, and what happens if it rains? The corn gets all mushy. So it, it's, it's kind of a problem. And I don't know if they're still working on it or not. Um, so there, years ago, they came out with this, these tubes, the Daminix tubes. And it's a, just a, basically a toilet paper roller, um, the cardboard part, with cotton balls in it. And the cotton balls are impregnated with permethrin. Um, the, the cotton. The white-footed mice like soft, white, fluffy things, not necessarily white, soft, fluffy things in their nest. Um, and they'll take it to their nest, and it'll kill the ticks on, on the um, white-footed mouse. <coughs> um, someone's dr the, um, trying an oral B. burgdorferi vaccine, a, a Lyme spirochete vaccine for the mice. Um, someone else is trying to take a mouse and genetically engineer, although that's not the proper term, actually, based on what the author told me, and try to make a super mouse that's resistant to the Lyme spirochete. That's going to be expensive. Um, and a recent study was just published new, based in New Jersey by Bob Jordan, um, and this worked very well at controlling ticks. Um, and they use um, another, I think it's fipronil, it's another, another um, or maybe the permethrin, I forget which uh, pesticide they use, but it's very good at controlling the ticks um, on the mice. Um, compared to the control area. Um, and they're also trying uh, that same protocol, but adding doxycycline to kill the spirochetes in the mice. But, I'm, no, won't, did I say kill the mice? No, kill the spirochetes in the mice. Okay, uh, it won't kill the mice. Um, what, 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 did you say, can we kill the mice? It's hard to kill the mice. Um, so, um, but I'm a microbiologist. I've been studying antibiotic resistance my whole life. Putting doxycycline out in the environment is not a good idea. OK, this is my last slide. Um, remember something about parasites. They drag down their hosts the way taxes and interest rates drag down an economy. But taxes and interest rates also prevent an economy from growing too fast and then crashing. Slow, steady growth is what our Federal Reserve Bank tries to achieve so too with parasites. Of course, that's easy to put that in the context of a wild animal, but if it's your dog or your kid or your mom or your dad, it's hard to, to fathom that concept. Um, so if you have any more questions, let me know. Um, thank you for your attention. Right. Uh, if they do it the right way, um, they have to do it the right time of year. Um, and they, a lot of times, I'm sorry? Oh, the, the, I'm sorry, the question was, can landscapers treat for ticks? In theory, they can, but they have to do it the right way. They have to um, do it the right time of year. Um, the other thing is, they have to get penetration. Those larvae and nymphs, like the leaf litter, does the pes pesticide get down there? I don't know. Yes, they're mostly, uh, because um, with respect to the deer tick, they dry out very quickly. So they have to stay in the leaf litter. Um, and they're definitely not going to be on your sunny lawn. They may be on the shady lawn near the woods, but they're not going to be in the sunny lawn. They'll, they'll dry out like that. More question? No, they don't hang off, vegeta they don't hang off the trees and climb on your head because um, 
They're looking for a host. What are they going to find up there, right? Uh, no. Um, so I've been collecting dog ticks recently, and the highest they go is like 12 inches. And I, I go out there and I measure them. People think I'm a weirdo, but I have to do a thesis. So what do you mean? The right. Yeah, so if you're bitten, let's say you're, you're, you're bitten by a black-legged tick. Let's say it's infected. Let's say you become infected. Those are all three conditionally different things. If they do a test immediately, the test is not going to come up positive. If they wait two or three weeks, it might come up positive. But the test is, I don't, I don't want to use the term reliable. Like, again, I'm not a, I'm not a clinician. I'm not a physician. So, um, And then if that test uh, comes out equivocal or partially positive, then they do a further test, a Western blot, which is more advanced and more expensive. Right. Ah, right. No. Right. So you had the neurological symptoms, and and that's interesting because a good friend of mine. The first thing he knew, he had Lyme, or he knew something was wrong was um, he forgot where he parked his car. And he was driving home. He forgot how to get home. Um, his wife noticed a rash on his back. So it's rare to see the rash and the neurological things simultaneously. Yeah. So if you get, and what's that? Ah, okay. And that's the other thing. If you are bitten by a tick and it is infected and you do get infected, if you get a rash and you won the lottery, because maybe that was a bad choice of words. But you at least know you're infected. Yes. Right. Yeah. You won't see a rash in your hair, or, or if you have. Right. Um, and remember, not you know, the deer, dog ticks won't transmit the Lyme spirochete. You won't get a rash in that. Um, but that's where usually where the dog ticks go. So yeah, save the tick if you're bitten. I mean, I don't recommend getting it tested, but save it this way. You can at least help the diagnosis for the, from the physician. And the reason why we don't recommend testing them is because, let's say you're bitten by a tick, it's infected, it fed on you, but you don't become infected, and the tick tests positive. You're going to take antibiotics for no reason. So, and let's say um, you're bitten by a tick, it's infected, you become infected, they test the tick and it's negative. That's why we don't recommend testing the tick. Paraforceps, paraforceps, tweezers, because the longer... I just pull it back. I just get it as close to the skin as possible and pull it back. Because people say, uh, oh, the, the, the mouth parts. But the body will reject that. Um, so people say put Vaseline on it to suffocate it. It's going to take, oh, three days to suffocate the thing. So, uh, or put uh, something on it and light it. Well, if it's engorged and it's infected, you're going to spray tick guts everywhere. So the thing to do is remove it as quickly as possible. Yeah, or or antibacterial uh, soap or the you know antibiotic cream, um, and then just keep an eye on it. Um, yeah, sometimes the mouth parts stay in, but I I'm pretty sure the body will reject that. I mean I have a tick bite from the Lone Star tick. Uh, people have a rash from it. 
it, it's from the tick bite itself, not anything it transmitted, as far as I know. No, I, I use DEET, uh, you know, the, the insect repellent. And, um, <clears throat> and, and sometimes I'll put um, um, permethrin on my clothes. Permethrin's an insecticide. You can't put it on your skin. You can only put it on your clothes. But DEET, you can put it on, on your skin. <clears throat> There's also, um, it, it's not lemon oil. It's not eucalyptus oil. It's, it's lemon oil of eucalyptus. I'll have to get the name for Michelle. Oil of lemon I think oil. it works. Actually, Bob Jordan, he is actually the tick expert in New Jersey. That's what he uses. Okay. All right, thanks for your attention. You're welcome. Jim, Jim, um, you were talking about the leaf litter. Oh yes. And that ticks like the some ticks like the moist. You were talking about how some are going to be on the uh, on the bushes. And can you talk a little about landscaping for that tick safe yard? Sure. Um, so landscape your yard for for to diminish the threat. You're never going to reduce it or eliminate it. You'll reduce it, but you're never going to eliminate it. So if if you have um, a yard that it butts up to the woods. So what you can do is, um, let's say in the winter, um, really cold day, so there's no threat of ticks biting you, clean out the leaf litter, okay? And then you can cut down the smaller vegetation if the deer already haven't done it. And then um, what you can do is put wood chips on right before the woods, and it's like a baseball warning track. Anybody, don't go past that warning track. There's ticks back there. Um, but like I said, some... Like your question, pest control operators do um, treat for ticks. I just, um, I don't, I'm not a pest control person, so I don't know what they use. Um. Powassan? Yeah. yeah, that's, Powassan virus has been in the news lately. Um, so that is transmitted by the Ixodes scapularis, the same tick that transmits Lyme disease, babesiosis, and anaplasmosis. Um, but it's not very prevalent. So let's say, for example, in a very hot area with Lyme disease, maybe 50% of the adults will be infected. With Powassan virus, maybe 6% will be infected. The, that's the good news. The bad news is with Powassan virus, transmission can happen in less than an hour. So, but people don't usually manifest symptoms. Um, it's the neurological symptoms and a small percentage of the people that do contract it that have that can have problems. Ah, oil of lemon eucalyptus. Thank you. So you knew before I did. Okay. Somerset County has been talking over the past year about Fight the Bite. That's the uh, little logo that you've seen here. We spent a lot of time talking about how to protect yourself from mosquitoes, but the nice thing about the types of things that protect you from mosquitoes are also quite effective in protecting you against ticks. So uh, our experts, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, their recommendations for bug sprays, insect repellents for both mosquitoes and ticks are any ones that contain DEET, the recommendation is at least 20% DEET. Um, what we found is when you go to the stores to look for the products, and you notice we're talking ingredients and not a particular brand, is you really need to read the labels. And we've spent a lot of time, like Jim's been spending time hunting down ticks, Stacy Tulin, my colleague and I have been spending our time reading labels or trying to read labels on um, insect repellents. Problem is they don't make it easy. They make the print very small, very light, with a uh, terrible contrast. So if you're really trying to read it, it's incredibly difficult. The um, US EPA is trying to make the labels have the ingredients very large and very visible, but that's still in progress. So what I'm going to tell you, though, is when you're looking at it, there, um, even if uh, brand X 
has a pink bottle, has a green bottle, has a blue bottle. You really need to read the labels because just because one may have a 20% DEET, another one may only have seven. Some DEET's better than no DEET, but we still pretty much preach the Centers for Disease Control's recommendations because they're the ones that have studied this and have found what is most effective. Um, they've also found a few other things, and we have a lot of information on the table outside, so we don't actually expect folks to remember these names. There's enough things so that you can take with you so that if you're going to the store looking for them. Um, I have found, though, also, if you're looking for these things, some will have it in the uh, end cap of the store where you find all the insect repellents. But if you're in your big box store, they store the repellents in a number of different places. So for some of the ones with the higher concentrations, you might want to look at the camping sporting section rather than the sections where moms are buying the uh, sun lotion. If you are going to put on the sunblock, because you don't want to get burnt as well as uh, getting the um, um, insect bites, you want to put the sunblock on first and then put on the insect repellent. Another great thing that you can do is the uh, purchase clothing that already has the insect repellent on it. You can treat the clothes yourselves, but it washes out after a few washes. If you get the clothes that are treated themselves, they can last up to 70 washes or so. So that'll help you with your protection. Um, if you are going to go out in woods and play in places where ticks are more likely to roam, how do you go out, Jim? Do you go out in shorts and open-toed sandals? Recommendations there, though, if you are deep in the woods. is. Today I was nymph hunting, and so I wore a Tyvek suit, a full white Tyvek suit because the nymphs are small, I'm old, I can't see, and I'm never going to find these things. Um, but when I'm going for adults um, or, deer or dog ticks, you can stand, believe it or not, on the side of the road, and they'll be on the grass right by the side of the road, so you can wear shorts. I mean, I'm working on a talk called Adventures in Tick Collecting, <clears throat> and everywhere I go, um, I take pictures of the ticks hanging off the vegetation, and um, so so for for dog ticks, I'll, I, I'll wear shorts, um, but you still got to do a tick check, and I wear DEET. Question is: Is the county doing any public prevention or spraying for ticks? The county does have a regular control program for mosquitoes. They don't arbitrarily just go out and spray. Um, they do a lot of monitoring because they don't want to spray just for the sake of spraying. They do know the particular areas where there tend to be more mosquitoes and they're on top of those. They also, um, and as part of the monitoring, they bring out a number of different mosquito collecting devices that they put out to try to find out not only are mosquitoes out there, but what types of mosquitoes are there. Because not all mosquitoes uh, blood suck humans. There are some mosquitoes that will just eat uh, fruits and vegetables. So because of that, you don't want to you don't want to kill them all off. Um, there is a um, we did a program like this um, about this time last year. It was specific to mosquitoes. Scott Krantz from Rutgers um, 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 came out. He's now with the State Department. Um, uh, Department of Environmental Protection. However, we also had the county mosquito control folks out here talking. That is recorded. It's still available online on the Franklin Township website. And for fo folks who are here today, on the table I have a QR code. Um, so all you would need to do is take your phone, snap that QR code. It will take you directly into the video. So that should be helpful for you as well. Um, last thing, if you're really interested in talking directly with the mosquito folks at the county, that phone number is 908-231-7000. That will get you to the operator. Just ask to be connected over to Mosquito Control. Be happy to chat with you on that. Um,
All right, I'm going, I'm going to echo Jim in that I am not a doctor. Uh, yeah, but what I, um, for folks that do have the rash or the first thing we tell you is go to your primary care physician, they're going to be able to better direct you as to what your particular needs are. Hoping to have a, yes. The county, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak on behalf of the mosquito control only to the point of where I've heard them speak before. So again, I, I'll put the caveat there that you might want to give them a call. County cannot directly go on private land. What they can do is go out and talk to folks and try to do education and see what they can see from outside. One thing I want to tell you, though, is about mosquitoes. Mosquitoes, we know where the large bodies of water are. We know where the swampy areas are. We all pretty much know that mosquitoes might live in an unattended swimming pool. One of the bigger problems with mosquitoes are that they can breed in very small quantities of water. That bottle cap that Jim has on his water, if, uh, if that was left in a backyard with water in it, after rains and it sits for seven days, it could conceivably grow up to 300 mosquitoes. May not sound a lot to a whole lot of folks, but how many mosquitoes does it take to annoy you? One. So one of the things that we're doing is to try to get folks to be aware of taking care of things that hold small quantities of water. Um, we Think about in your backyard, what things are likely to collect water. Yeah, you've got dog bowls, you've got flower pots, you've got your um, bird uh, baths, but the biggest collection of things, small sources of water that can hold mosquitoes tend to be either dad's toys or the kids' toys. Uh, Dina Fonseca is my advisor, my PhD advisor, and she's a mosquito person. And, um, they published a study a couple years ago. They found a large population of mosquitoes love those corrugated downs downspouts, the drains that come off your, the because the, they're they're ribbed, right? So it holds water loaded with Asian tiger mosquitoes, and Asian tiger mosquitoes um, are container breeders. They're not going to find them in a lake, or in fact, you rarely find mosquitoes in a lake because the fish eat them. So it's these plastics. It's the problem. Um, and that's the problem they're having in South America with Zika uh, and Chikungunya. Those mosquitoes, Aedes aegypti, the yellow fever mosquito, are container breeders. So up here we have the Asian tiger mosquito. That's, a, again, a container breeder. Um, but, yeah, the corrugated downspouts, or whatever they're called, can hold water. So also where it goes to having a tick safe zone in your backyard, which also help you with the, the mosquitoes, we also have information on how to maintain your yard. It's things like cut back the bushes, keep the lawn less than that 12 inches, get rid of water sources, again, it goes to the mosquitoes, but that helps protect you on a number of different things and ways. And one of the other things we want to talk about a little bit, and did, um, did Katie have to go out? Okay, well, well, we'll show you a little bit. We have, we have uh, our animal expert, Katie Nordhaus, who's with uh, Franklin Township Animal Control. She's here to, um, she came with her puppy to be able to physically demonstrate how to um, check your dog for ticks. In the meantime, while we're waiting for her, because she just got pulled out on a call, um, I do have some videos from Pet MD to kind of give a little bit of background on them, and they aren't bad, so let me see if I can pull those up for you.
ticks are nasty parasites that feed on blood and can transmit dangerous diseases to our pets. While any dog can be exposed, canines who spend a lot of time outside are more susceptible to a bite. Ticks are tiny. For example, deer ticks are about the size of a sesame seed, and some species are as small as a grain of sand. To keep your dog healthy, it's important to regularly check for ticks after outdoor playtime and walks, even if your dog is already on a preventative flea and tick medication. Here are some simple tips to help check your dog for ticks. Unlike fleas and other insects, ticks do not jump or fly. They latch onto your dog from the ground and crawl upwards. Ticks are drawn to moist, dark areas on the body. It's also important to note that dogs with longer fur give ticks more opportunities to hide. So if you have a breed with longer hair, make sure to spend extra time looking for these pesky Start by examining your dog's skin for any area that is red or irritated. If you see a spot, get in closer to see if a tick is causing the irritation. Then, starting at your dog's head, use your fingers like a comb and run your hands down your dog's body. If you're looking for any lumps or bumps that you previously took, make sure to check under your dog's collar, in the groin, and under the front legs. It's also important to look under the tail and in between the toes. Check your dog's ears thoroughly, inside and out. It might be helpful to use a flashlight when examining the ear canal. Using a brush or a flea comb is also a good idea when checking your dog for ticks. If you hit a bump or a snag, don't force the comb over the bump. Stop, part the fur, and look for what's causing the bump before proceeding. Make sure to check your dog for ticks frequently to ensure that she stays safe, happy, and healthy. And I do have one other companion video with that. Ticks can transmit deadly diseases to your pet hours of a bite, so swift removal is key. Here's the best way to remove a tick from your dog or cat so you're prepared to get rid of these dangerous sites. First, you'll need a pair of latex or rubber gloves because ticks carry infectious agents that can bloodstream through breaks in It's best to play it safe and wear protective gear. When remove a tick, it's important to keep your pet calm because any unusual poking or prodding tends to make pets nervous. If there's someone else available, have that person hold your pet to help keep her calm. And now you're ready to remove the tick. Take a pair of tweezers, the pointy kind work best, and grab a hold of the tick as close to your dog's skin as possible. Be careful not to pinch, though. Using steady pressure, pull the tick out using a straight motion. Be careful not to twist or jerk the tick because you want to avoid leaving mouth parts behind. Also make sure not to squeeze or crush the tick because the fluids may contain infectious materials. Kill the tick by placing it in a container of rubbing alcohol. Once the tick is dead, most veterinarians recommend keeping the tick in your pet starts displaying symptoms. Your veterinarian might want to evaluate the tick if your pet starts showing signs of infection. Use antiseptic spray or rubbing alcohol to disinfect the pet. Keep an eye on it for signs of infection. The area becomes red or inflamed. Make, make sure to keep a close eye on your dog or cat over the next few weeks. Be on the lookout for any strange symptoms like reluctance to move, fever, fatigue, loss of appetite, or swollen lymph nodes. If your pet displays any of these symptoms, make an appointment with your veterinarian. And for the question that came up earlier about how to re best remove the um, tick off of yourself, that actually was a great illustration. Um, the, um, from what my understanding is, is the pointy tip tweezers are better than a uh, flat or beveled tweezer because it's going to allow you to pull out the tick without squishing it and getting it to release um, the blood and fluids back onto you. Um, yes, ma'am. There, there, yeah, there are, there are a number of products out there. I think the one you're talking about is called a tick key. 
Um, the ones for pets is a little bit different from the ones I've seen for people. Work similarly. Some of them look like a plastic spoon with a little notch cut into it, and that allows you just to go in, pull down, and scoop up. Um, the reason why the recommendation on the tweezer is because we're presuming everyone has that at home, and there are some folks that can't afford to buy the specialized tools in order to be able to uh, remove it. Um, but back to the, you know, the alcohol and um, afterwards so you can disinfect, and that if you do have any effects or concerns, it's go, to, in this case, if it's your um, um, pet to your veterinarian, or if it's to you, your children, your spouses, um, check back with your health care provider. Recommendations also for humans is that if you are out and outside and playing about, to check yourself and your children, your loved ones, for ticks when they come back in. Um, shower as quickly as possible. When you come back in, usually the recommendations there is within two hours. And um, because you want to make sure you get them off as quickly as possible before they've had a chance to have a huge blood meal. Uh, am I missing anything there, Jim? I went to a public a meeting, a tick meeting, a few about a year ago, and they call it tick check Vermont foreplay. <laughs> so it's it's pretty widespread. You need to check yourself. It's the best way to do it. Do we have any other questions? I was hoping Katie would come back, but she's got to take care of. Yes, ma'am. Are all ticks infected with Lyme disease? No. Um, uh, so I did a study years ago, and I collected adults in a park called Watchung Reservation. 50% of the adults were infected. But adult ticks normally don't transmit it to humans because they're big and they come out in the in the fall and the winter. In a in a hot area, like what I mean in terms of Lyme disease epidemiology, maybe twenty percent of the ticks can be infected. The nymphs can be infected. Um, so not no, not all of them are infected. Yes, the 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 black legged tick can only get infected when it picks up the spirochete from another animal, and around here it's usually a white-footed mouse. Could be a chipmunk, sometimes it's a bird. Yeah. Uh, no, 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 I'm sorry, good question. The question was, are white-footed mouse naturally infected? No, they get it from a tick that's infected if they're born, because they're born uninfected. So the the if you have an uninfected white uh, white footed mouse, it gets it from the the tick. So okay, now you're thinking, well, what's what's the chicken and what's the egg? Well, like I said, for any vector borne disease, there has to be a reservoir, a vector, and a pathogen. So the reservoir in this case is is the is the white footed mouse. So yes, it does contract it, the spirochete from a tick, uh, but that's where in the environment that's where this bacterium hangs out. So I hope that answers your question. I don't know the answer to that question. The question was, does the mouse mother transmit it to the offspring? And I don't know the answer to that question. I have to look that up when I get home. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, so the question, the, the, yeah, the question is, so you do a tick check, what about your clothing? So um, they recently a study was published on, on washing your clothes, um, and I, I forget what the data was, but the, the black-legged tick is not going to survive very long in your house, especially in the winter with the dry heat. Um, and I'm going to guess, and I'm going to say 
even if you don't want your wash your clothes, you leave them in the hamper. The the black legged ticks probably going to die in a day. Um, dog ticks and Lone Star ticks are going to last a little longer. So yes, you should if you do suspect ticks, just wash them immediately, and either put them in the dryer when they're done or hang them in the sun. Yeah, so chipmunk syrup are a reservoir for the live spirochete as well. Get the, get the shotgun. No, just kidding. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so, I mean, and then the question is, do you have ticks? So, I mean, I get that question all the time. Well, you have to have everything required in order to have the Lyme disease cycle in your area. I mean, you have to have infected ticks, reservoirs, and, you know, all the other stuff. Okay, thank you. How can folks contact you if they have questions? Oh. Um, my that information. So, uh, james.oc at rutgers.edu. And I, I work in the medical school in Newark. That's how I pay the mortgage. And then I go to s school in New Brunswick. But that that um, address works for either place. OCCI, sorry. James.oc um, at Rutgers.edu. Yeah, I thank you for that. On behalf of Somerset County Department of Health, we'd like to thank Jim for being here. Franklin Township thanks you as well. For the folks that are here, it's still a table outside. A lot of information on fighting the bite, mosquitoes and ticks. If anyone has questions for the County Department of Health, you can reach us at 908-231-7155. Um, our Twitter and Facebook information is up online as well. So thank you and wish you all a pleasant evening.